let's talk a little bit about Rams Botham there. He was, by all accounts, uh, underprepared for what he was facing, there, there's a, uh, a little bit caught off guard. To some extent, it's a cultural weakness in Bermuda, I, I can say, that sometimes we don't, we're not too good at reflecting on what's happened in the past and drawing, and, and important for me, was what lessons are drawn from that period. So with Ramsbottom, um, I had, you know, I was very objective and I was really surprised in some of the things I found. There's a real backstory with him through the whole book. I didn't know that he had been dumped from his ambassador position in Washington by David Owen. David Owen was a foreign secretary in the UK. He was dumped from that position. And then just a number of months later, who does he report to? David Owen. They had a massive divide, a massive falling out over the whole hanging, their communication in, in late uh, 1977. And virtually till the day Ramsbottom died, he was very angry is probably not the right word, but he was, he was a diplomat, right? But he made it clear in a published interview done 24 years after he left Bermuda, just how much animosity he had towards David Owen and blamed him for a significant failure of communication at the critical time. None of this was known at the time because the public didn't have access to the documents. There was no internet. There was no freedom of information. There were a lot of surprises about Ramsbottom. Um, one of the big ones was just how flat-footed he was caught by the scale of the violence and the eruption of the society back then. He was caught off guard. One key issue where I'd give him credit for, he did side with the Progressive Labour Party on the need for electoral reform, yeah. which didn't come till 2003. And speaking on siding with the then the opposition Progressive Labour Party, the FCO, their legal advisors, when it came to the issue of uh, clemency, uh, Lois Brown Evans took the position from day one mm -hmm. that the government and the governor did have the ability to grant that, did have the ability to stop the executions. Right. The governing party, Sir David Gibbons, always claimed that he didn't have that. They agreed with the position of Lois Brown Evans at, at the governor being able to exercise clemency right up until the final moments before the execution. So while we were being told here, then our hands are tied, there's really right. not much that we can do, right. uh, the FCO's legal advisors themselves were saying, no, you can, if, if you are prepared to do it, it can be done. And a good chunk of the book that deals with the process of the executions and the executions could have been prevented at a number of points along the way and that's one of the more complex areas of the book that I had to really wrap my head around because there was a lot of legalese but in a nutshell Sir David I did find evidence that Sir David did consider an emergency parliamentary debate in that final week so in other words the executions were announced on November 25th the court, courts had done their bit, and the appeal process had done their bit. But Sir David Gibbons announced in Parliament on the 25th of November, the execution will take place one week from today. So that one week, a good chunk of the book is spelt with, spend its time on what happened in that one week. And a number of things could have happened. We learn in the book that he, he actually considered an emergency parliamentary debate to do away with capital punishment. We learn also that yes, Sir Peter Ramsbottom could have at any time exercised his own discretion. We learned also that um, David Owen, later Lord David Owen, who's, who's one of the, he's the only cabinet minister, minister from the UK who played a significant part in Bermuda's events that's actually still alive, because he was quite a young man at the time of the riots. We learned too that he could have, and he could have advised the Queen to grant. So there's this enormous sort of play on the legal aspects of that time. But I guess one of the biggest ironies, um, Sherry, that myself and anybody else that lived through that time has, has noted is that without the events of 77, the question mark would be how much progress really would Bermuda have made? Because we were making snail's pace progress up to 77, and it was up to the Pitt Commission, commissioned after the riots, to really say, country, you've got to change. If they had not hanged, where might we be today and how much further behind might we be? And unsatisfactorily further behind, I might say. Hi, caller. Welcome. You are on air. Good morning, uh, 
Uh, Brother Smith, this is Ralph Comission, and I just want to quickly say that I I think that you might be on the verge of uh, becoming a part of that pantheon of great Bermudian uh, historians who have helped us to fill in the blanks somewhat of of our, at times, tortuous history. I, with with my mates from Spanish Point, walked to Hamilton that evening to join the old of boys in uh, being part of what I guess is more commonly referred to the 1968 riots. And I remember us being on Court Street uh, near the Dunumant, the near the, the final part of that of that evening, when the troops were coming down, maybe in the police, coming down Court Street from where the Lewis Brown Evans building is now, uh, northward to where we were by Annan's Variety Store. I'm, I'm dating myself. Uh, and then the, the tear gas dispersing us and how we went through Brooklyn and back out to Wood- Woodlands Road that evening to our neighborhood out Spanish Point by Almaty House, and none of our parents, of course, were there with a belt getting ready to lick us because they knew what the deal was. I think you're right in saying that it was a great failure on the part of the country uh, by proceeding with the hanging. Uh, I think it was to send a signal, frankly, to young black men of my age and older uh, to teach them a lesson, uh, if you will. But I believe that the the damage that was done to particularly our young working class black males in the aftermath of that, for example, I had a conversation yesterday, and I'll wrap up right here, Sherry, with a friend, and we were reflecting on that period. Uh, He's about my age. We're talking about late 50s. And he was saying how so many of those young men, and you talked about the numbers of those who would have been either uh, key figures within the Black Bermudian cadre, that 40 or 50 or so, and then the 200 supporters or sympathizers, well, they would have been in that group, young men. And after that period, so many of them went on a self-destructive path. They turned inward. Many of them started using drugs as the, the scourge of drugs began to take over too many of our communities and households. Uh, latterly, by the time of the 80s, a number of those young men who would have been right on the front line of that, that, that battle against the racist oligarchy that was destroying so many life chances here would have ended up dying from AIDS, for example. And so the consequences of us not addressing this issue and getting it right in 77 are still resonating uh, through Bermuda today. My aim in the last few years, now that I've left the police, I can speak far more openly on a lot of issues. And, you know, I approach this in a very fearless way. I think I understand the route that Bermuda has gone. There are, there are things that happened in the past that were just devastating to the largely black community. And until we confront that devastation, until we confront the real issues, some of which are prevalent today, which I know we're gonna get into before this program finishes, then, then more Bermudians need to have that conversation. Black Bermudians have been at the forefront of every significant social change in Bermuda. White Bermudians have not. They've sat back, they've been silent, and I'm seeing it to this day in the response to my book. The comments that are made both online, Facebook, it's very clear where the support lined up with what Rolf just said, where the compliments, it's very clear where they're coming from and why they're coming from. There is still a state of denial in our country and until we address the fundamental issues, then we, the final paragraph in the book says, Let's make sure that if there's ever another royal commission, that this issue of race is not front and center. I don't think we're there yet. On page 40 of your book, it, it speaks to how the the local authorities and the UK authorities concentrated a lot on the political, those persons who they believed were involved maybe with a political party for political reasons. They concentrated on persons who were affiliated with the unions and organizations and basically, uh, to a certain degree, ignored the other things that were growing within the community. It was clear the UK knew of racial tensions and what was likely to serve as a catalyst for civil disorder. It was also evident that the threat to security criteria concentrated heavily on two things, those with left-wing political and opposition affiliations and spontaneous flare-ups of violence by black Bermudians, usually following an encounter with the police. Thus, the governor's own bit concentrated almost exclusively on political threats to internal security. Absent from that threat to security criteria of this era, 
were contemporary crimes such as serious violent and organized crime and the growing drug problem, all of which threatened national security and were arguably equal to or more serious than political affiliations. I was really keen to discover that, that the threats to national security were viewed as political threats. They weren't actually viewed as as the contemporary crime problems of the day. And I think that goes a long way to explaining how there, we were so devastated through the 70s, 80s, and 90s with drug and crime problems because yeah. the... The focus was on, yeah, exactly. on political organizations or exactly. unions or, or other organizations. Exactly. And the drug, the growing drug issue and all those were left to fester, quite frankly, and grow. That was exactly my point. I saw it all. My ear has always been to the ground. I've always started the of social behavior and from a psychological point of view. What I've noticed most, Mr. Smith, and maybe you could help me out, since, 19, since after 1977, the whole... Uh, uh, our police force strategy in the police force changed. I, from what I uh, uh, perceive, was that they changed from a more passive uh, approach to a more aggressive policing. Every time a little incident broke out, no matter if it was at a bar, at a, at a football game, or wherever it took place, the police would turn up in large numbers and buy in paddy wagons. Has, has, has that event slowed down or is that still a part in effect? And I've noticed that since 1977. There were a succession of reports through the 70s, 80s, and 90s that were critical of police methodology in tackling street level drug crime. And the reports, I'm really paraphrasing a lot of very complex work here, but the, the reports were critical to the extent that they criticized the police for concentrating on the black drug problem. I think that's virtually the phrase that they, that they use. A lot of the methodology has changed and the, the work now is far more intelligence driven. And just as a complete aside, one of the, the, the next book I'm working on is one that's gonna tackle policing from the 1970s right the way through to 2016, 17, which is about the time I think I'll be able to finish it. Um, it's gonna be tackling and providing some analysis on the changing police methodology. Mm -hmm.